Hello, I'm Linda Seif from The Layered Onion. Thank you for joining us. We will be listening to our amazing creators talk about their art and mental health. 48 million artists all over the world share this lived experience. The Layered Onion was formed to create a supportive community, allowing the creators to focus on their art, bringing their work from the shadows to receive the recognition and opportunities they deserve. Each podcast will feature an artist who talks about their creations and mental wellness. Art is healing. We hope these discussions will inspire you to appreciate the stories behind the creations and more importantly, inspire your inner creator. Together, we can tackle the stigma surrounding mental health. Hello, Yusuf. How are you? Hello. I'm doing swell. How are you, Linda? I'm great. Maybe you could introduce yourself and tell everyone where you're from and what are your different mediums of art. Okay, so my name is Yusuf Benrilla. I am from Madison, Wisconsin, born and raised, and um, I co-founded an organization called Trade Roots, um, Trade Roots Farms, Trade Roots Kitchens, and we um, we basically grow food in the community, um, also offer workshops and teach classes on um, introduction to agriculture and urban farming, and then we show people throughout the growing season, what we can do with the stuff that we grow, um, how to cook it into delicious, nutritious meals that not only, um, taste great and are good for your body, but they also look great aesthetically. So So maybe you could talk a bit um, about the inspiration for trade roots. So trade roots is basically the, it's a play on the word route where some people say like route 66 or route 66. So trade routes is, um, was a, the inspiration was to raise money to go to West Africa. Um, we did genealogical tests and discovered that uh, a friend of mine, Devin Hamilton discovered that we were from Benin, um, Nigeria, Togo, West Africa. So, um, Together with Michael Twitty, he wrote a book called The Cooking Gene. We um, we started Trade Roots to raise money. Essentially, we would do pop-ups, um, selling food for $10 a plate. We did a couple weddings, and we raised uh, $10,000 that we needed, roughly, to go to West Africa. It took about a year. And then, um, so yeah, that was the, that was the, um, I guess the beginning of trade routes or the inspiration. And then it's kind of transformed. Like once in West Africa, I realized um, with our history of agriculture um, that it I needed to do a little bit more when I came back. So that's when I really dove into farming more. Um, and before that, I was working on helping people, uh, some Native American friends of mine, with their farms and their farm plots but I wasn't growing anything from the African diaspora really. So, uh, yeah, we founded trade roots. Devin has since moved on, um, and started an organization in Los Angeles called grilling for the people. And, um, he's doing amazing stuff out there. He's urban farming. He's working as a chef. He's also got uh, a smoker and like a little food cart. Um, but yeah, trade roots really kind of was a catalyst to launch us, you know, headlong into our cultural rediscoveries. And then also, um, you know, along that journey, it gave us the, the information that we needed to take it to the next level. So what was the most, what was the most surprising that you learned when you were on your trip about the food or Um, about, about anything? Well, just like the, you know, the immediate um, connection that I felt like, you know, from some of the first moments when we landed and then we, you know, um, traveled through ben- from Togo to Benin, um, going to the markets and seeing like all of our foods, you know, black eyed peas, 
um, okra, collard greens, all of the foods, you know, um, from the diaspora, tomatoes, corn, all of that, like in the markets, like our whole cultural story was like in the market, in their food markets where it's not the same here. You know, you might get little glimpses of that in the ethnic food sections of some restaurants, but it's not like everything's just laid out in abundance. Um, and then just the, um, the, the ingenuity and, uh, resilience of the people, you know, there's not a lot of farm equipment, a lot of, a lot of labors done, um, by human hands. And just like the beauty with that, we would, that we were able to farm and are able to farm, you know, the Spanish, the Portuguese, they saw that. And that's why they stole us is because of our artistry in agriculture. So as you think about, um, you know, going to a marketplace and obviously seeing food that you grew up with and that have been a part of your culture, but yet when you come here, it isn't something you see everywhere. What was the biggest, um, I guess, was there any kind of aha moment that made you think about what you were going to do next from that experience? Absolutely. I just knew that I had to grow those things, that anything that I could grow somewhere, you know, here in Madison, Wisconsin, we're at 43 degrees north latitude, anything I could grow in our um, climate that would, uh, so that I could have those things and have access to those things. And to also to share those with, um, we have a large West African population, or we have a large African population in Dane County, and also a large um, Caribbean and diasporic immigrant population, um, Haiti, Costa Rica, Jamaica, um, and, uh, you know, like where, where are they able to source those ingredients? So, you know, um, this year I'm not growing garden eggs, but in the past I've grown garden eggs. This year I'm growing a lot of okra. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of corn, um, just to see, you know, it's just like a, a agricultural experiment for me, but growing collard greens, celosia, black eyed peas, pigeon peas, um, watermelons, we're growing all that stuff. Um, I have a plot at Allen Centennial Gardens. I also have a plot at State Capitol and, it's, you know, it's shown people, you know, like even just the first year when I was growing garden eggs, I had a woman from West Africa say that she never thought she would see fresh garden eggs here. Like you can get like garden eggs at some Asian markets, but they're just definitely not fresh. But so she was super happy to see that. And as are a lot of people, um, you know, it's uh, growing the food that kept us alive for millennia that kept us, you know um in solid nutrition um and in our medicines as well so yeah that that's a big you know that is an important step to take is like how can i recreate even a small version of this marketplace here in my hometown and uh and be able to share that with other folks so how Amazing is it that you have a plot up at the Capitol or Allen Centennial Gardens where people can actually see it because often sometimes the the community gardens are in a place that aren't uh, easily accessible for eyes. And so it mm -hmm. sounds like someone came by and actually saw the garden eggs and got pretty excited. And if your plot had been elsewhere, was that part of your thought process is having um the gardens in a places where people could see them well um you know it just that kind of came apart uh, um it was a lot of work you know getting those spaces um but i partnered with uh rooted i partnered with the folks at allen centennial and i've been you know i've worked for the university for a long time so i've had various roles at allen centennial um as far as a chef i used to just you know like um, I was given permission to harvest from there and we would utilize those ingredients in our um, dishes at Dejo Residence Hall. Um, and then over time, when people realized what I was doing, I was asked to participate. 
um, if I'd create an African diaspora garden at Allen Centennial. And then I wanted to create a BIPOC community garden at the state capitol. Um, and especially to get, you know, native corn growing up at the capitol, which we've grown for three years now, um, to get some collard greens and okra. You know, even I think as a for a public space, it's important to have those um, tools so that people know even further where their food comes from. Because if you walk around, you know, a kid walking around the farmer's market doesn't see the food growing and they might not always make that connection if it's all neatly packaged on a table for you, you know, um, and not necessarily packaged, but you know how like farmer's market stands have a certain aesthetic, but um, there's just so much engagement from the community when they walk around that garden space on King Street and they look at uh, the different vegetables growing and kids can sometimes identify vegetables or, you know, it gets their the wheels turning. We have a little QR code up there that kind of helps um, if people, you know, are interested in learning more about the organizations that help plant that garden space. But um, it's it's an invaluable tool to have physical growing um, spaces for people to see where their food comes from. Cause once kids make that connection, they don't lose it. And kids that don't have the connection, it, you know, they, that has to find them or they have to seek that out uh, later in life. And, um, it's not always the case, but just kids that I know that grow up with any introduction to agriculture, um, they're growing up with healthier minds. They know, more about the food system and for, for a food sovereignty perspective, it gives people the impetus that they need to, um, to grow their own foods and to see like, Hey, in this sort of space, I could grow this. Um, and even if you don't have a lot of land access, um, you know, you can grow some collard greens in a pickle bucket. You can grow okra in a pickle bucket. Um, so even starting on that scale, for just reclaiming some of the meals, you know, that you're eating each, um, each day, uh, or reclaiming some of the ingredients on your own. is very, very empowering. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Community. Yeah. It, well, I think you're right on to something about, so when I was a kid, um, behind my grandfather's house, kind of down a little path, we had a, a four acre, um, I guess you call it a truck garden where anything we harvested, we would, you know, end up selling on a truck or to a local market, et cetera. And at the time, of course, mm -hmm. um, it just felt like getting up at six in the morning, <laughs> you know, using a string to have yeah. straight rows. My brother, yeah. he was always leaving the velvet leaf and taking the pe beans and we found out later he did it on purpose so he wouldn't have to weed and the rest of us would. <laughs> yes. all, all these things that we did. And so when I first, um, when I left that, I actually ended up with um, my undergraduate degrees in agronomy, Yusuf. And, okay. Wow. Um, yeah. And so <laughs> I, I ended up, though, myself not gardening at a, a that level until a little bit later when my kids were growing I'm like yeah I got a garden again and had you know the raised garden in the back and all of that mm -hmm. and you know to this day still have I'm I'm really into my perennial flowers but I also have you know I've got right now more tomatoes than I know what to do with um mm -hmm. I never picked up the art of freezing my mother was the did a great job of blanching and freezing but anyway it's but you come back to it like you said and the difference yeah. between the fresh ingredients that you've gone out and picked is just it you can't it, it doesn't compare and there's no satisfaction like you know yeah, it's a little tedious to take the string out and get your straight rows but there's no <laughs> satisfaction like having those straight rows when all the vegetables are coming up and just having that order it's like you know it's like planting a story um and yeah and and again you do you do come back to it like you know i, I my mom grew tomatoes and stuff when i was a kid and you know kids in our neighborhood would laugh at you or like they'd tease you'd say like oh you guys have to grow your own food because it was kind of looked down upon in some of the neighborhoods um 
And at the time, the only other people growing food were some of our immigrant neighbors like uh, Hmong and Vietnamese folks. And, um, you know, they would tease us. And then, you know, me and my siblings would cry and be like, oh, you know, why can't we order pizzas? Um, But we didn't know. And I didn't know that I wouldn't taste like a good tomato for many, many years after that. My mom stopped growing. Um, So, yeah, you do come back to it. And to have like at least a little bit of that knowledge, you can. uh, It's going to change your life. You know, you're going to you're going to impart that in some way. Um, as far as like, you, you know, you went on to be in agronomy, um, you know, so your agricultural childhood did have some impact or for you to even know that that was a possibility. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Like uh, kids at the Badger Rock school, uh, horticulture and food is a big part of their curriculum. And all the kids that I've seen come out of that program as they grow up, um, they, you know, they got their foot in the the soil. They know the importance of having connection to the land. So that's mm-hmm. just, you know, it's all about the education. So, yeah, having those spaces, it's a great place for uh, people to learn. And it's, you know, and it, it impacts thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Anybody that walks by that, you know, concerts on the square, um, anybody that visits Alan Centennial, they're seeing that. Um, those are also places that people can harvest for free they don't got to ask permission like i give permission um i call my collard greens at allen centennial a collard green bank Mm -hmm. where people can go deposit a little bit of love ceremoniously um and then withdraw greens and i have you know uh co-workers that that love the greens um i have a guy and you know the campus area I have a uh, chef coworker who lives in Eagle Heights and the campus area is really a food desert as far as like a grocery store within say walking distance of Eagle Heights. Or if you don't know like that there's food in the hospital or at some of the residence halls, you won't know where to go eat on campus. Um, but he can't get like, even though he lives next to Eagle Heights garden, he doesn't, um, they do grow a little bit of collard greens out there, but not like, you know, he loves collard greens. And so he's able to pick, collard greens there and uh have fresh collards all summer long throw them in a pot and cook them up so that those gardens are not just you know to be aesthetic um things to look at they're also to help you know with the food security balance um so that people got fresh you know people that know can go and grab some greens they can go grab some uh some okra and they can feed themselves some nutritious um, again, you know, the Capitol Square is kind of a food desert unless there's food trucks up there. Um, right. So, I mean, there's restaurants look, and stuff, but it's not accessible. Right, definitely. right. Totally not accessible. Uh, very expensive, actually, for most mm-hmm. people. So as you look to the future, what is your dream for trade routes? The goal is to get some, um, to get land, uh, you know, in or around Madison, and to just have a place to grow food. Um, we're working on like a round barn community center project. Um, and we're going to try to start doing some fundraising for that. And uh, yeah, the goal is just to keep, you know, introducing people to nutritious food, um, gain land access and uh, create, you know, safe space for people to celebrate their cultures and uh, their cuisine and food ways. That's pretty much it. Well, uh, what a great place to stop. That was yeah. lovely. And I really enjoyed talking to you. Um, you know, I think, as you and I both know, yeah. art is healing, whether you're cooking and gardening or um, creating, you know, creating art. So thank you. Very welcome. Pleasure to Pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us today. It is an honor to talk with these amazing creators. You can see and read the artist's work in The Shallot, our Journal of Mental Health, Art, and Literature, or on our website, thelairdaonion.com. Thank you. Thank you.